How can we stop that? What's a secret weapon to kind of nip that in the bud right away when we get to overthinking and we get in fear? Well, so one really easy way, and it teaches you three things. It says, retire your broken soundtrack. You talk about in your book how to turn the dial down when you start to get those soundtracks that are really loud. How do you do that? Well, so that was an idea. I was I was talking to a friend of mine named David. You have five borrowed soundtracks, and this is one of my favorite things in the book, when you tell the story about borrowed, but so can you explain a little bit about borrowed soundtracks? Yeah, so it can be. Hello, and welcome back to the True Grit and Grace podcast. Today on the show, I have John Acuff here, and I've been so excited to have him on, y'all. He's the New York Times bestseller of seven books. He speaks all over the world. In fact, he was just featured not long ago in Inc. Magazine as the top 100 leadership speakers in the world. Um, He's got a podcast and He's got my favorite book here, right here. It's called Soundtracks. And if you are ready to stop overthinking and ready to transform your life, I'm not just saying this. My my thoughts are never the same since I have read this book. So welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. That's such a that's such a kind intro. Well, I have been reading your book and I've got tons of pages. Um I've got highlighted, but you know what? Your book on Audible, I have to say, is my favorite book. I mean, my favorite book, because I'm sure a lot of people have told you they did have a lot of people said, I felt like you were talking to me. Yeah, I try to do it as a conversation. A few years ago, the first time I recorded an audiobook, I had to re record the entire thing because it wasn't conversational. So I really learned, you know, 10 years ago. You have to imagine you're having a conversation with a friend on a road trip. So imagine how a friend would talk to you if they are in the passenger seat of the driver's seat. So that's how I approach sharing the content. I try to add bonus stories and ideas. And so, yeah, I want it to be really funny. I want I I love when people say I was on the treadmill at the gym and I had to get off because I was laughing so hard. And they weren't expecting that from a book that's ultimately hopefully going to help you work on your goals, change your life. And so, yeah, that's how I approach it. And I have a good time. I have to change some words. There's words I write that I can't actually say, like the word rural, like I, the, eventually the sound engineer was like, dude, you, you can't, you don't even know how to say that. We changed it. (laughs) We changed it to country road instead of rural road, like rural road is hard. So it's it's a funny random experience to record it. But yeah, I, I love that. I get to do that. Well, it was incredible. And I really did think I felt like you were talking to me and I I was at the gym actually listening to your book and I would have to stop working out to take notes on my phone. Oh yeah. I've, and I just printed them out this morning. So I've got pages of notes and things that I don't ever want to forget, but my experience with my audible book was not very fun. Like I was in this little booth And at one point I I like busted out of the booth and I was like, I just need air and I just need to do some push-ups." And the sound engineer looked at me like, oh my gosh, we got a crazy one here. And I I did, I took some breaths, did some push-ups, and went back in. But for my next book, I am going to do my book, try to do it exactly like you did. I don't know if I'll be as funny or if anybody can be as funny as you, but you crack me up. 
And I wondered, I would love to see one of your talks um, at an event. Are you doing this? Is just, yeah, I'm just I mean, curious. Doing, are you doing any events that I could come yeah, to? I mean, that we could come to? Ones, a bunch of live ones are coming back. You know, it's still kind of a squirrely, a squirrely time right now. So you're figuring out, is it virtual? Is it live? So yeah, I usually do in a normal year, like 40 to 50 events. Um, and so, but I did a comedy night maybe two years ago. I actually did two nights and that was just a blast. So I've always... I grew up. So you did comedy. that. You did. Mm -hmm. com okay. Oh, that yeah, so explains it. I, uh, but that's my favorite. My niche is definitely, I use humor as a vehicle for truth. So like, I love that Chris Rock says there's some things people won't listen to unless they're laughing at the same time. So I try to really go, okay, how can I use humor to make this idea even stickier? So there's, you know, I write my ideas in layers where it's like, I get the idea, right. The words aren't right. I'm just I'm writing, writing, writing. If I need a quote, I just write need quote. If I stop to go look up the quote on the internet, I'm gone. Forget it. Like I'm out. I won't get back to the writing. So I'm writer and write. Then another layer would be like personal stories from other people. Another layer would be, okay, how do I add humor? Another layer would be, how do I make sure it's positive? Cause I tend to lean kind of like counting crows mopey right out of the gate. So I create my ideas and layers and I'm constantly adding another layer until I have the words, right? I have the idea, right? There's humor there. It's sticky. I, I consider my job, I'm a handle maker. I put handles on ideas so people can take them and use them in their lives. We have enough ideas in the world. We don't have handles on them to pick them up. And so I go, okay, how do I put a handle on this idea? So that's kind of my process, but humor is definitely a big part of it. Wow. That, that, I bet it would be so much fun just to sit with you and brainstorm about putting together a presentation or a book idea or. It's fun. I think it's a really neat process. And I've written seven books, so I'm, it's not an easy process. I think a good book always takes good work, but I've, I've got some things figured out where I go, okay, that's what this needs. That's what this needs. And so it's been fun to kind of mature in that process and help other people. Well, this book definitely helps other people soundtracks and in it, you're, you say it was like a secret that you had this system that you use, it was something that you used and it helped you get to New York Times bestseller. It helped you move to Nashville. Um, and then you're thinking, oh, well, maybe it just works for me, or I don't know if this would work for anybody else. And then you started to share it. You got it scientifically, you know, studies on it. Sure. You've got somebody with a PhD who you actually studied 10,000 people and tested these new affirmations and things like that on. Um, so a lot of us are in fear and, and you say that, you know, that we all, you know, that it's kind of like, we think of our, our, the things that we say over and over our overthinking is like, that's a personality trait, but you're really like, it's a sneaky way of fear seeping into us. And so how can we stop that? What's a secret weapon to kind of nip that in the bud right away when we get to yeah. overthinking and we get in fear? Well, so one really easy way, and it teaches you three things. It says, retire your broken soundtracks. And a soundtrack is just a repetitive thought. It's a phrase I use for repetitive thought. It's retire your broken ones, replace them with new ones, and then repeat the new ones so often they become as automatic as the old ones. And so if you said to me, okay, John, how do I even identify a broken soundtrack? The easiest, fastest way is to write down something you want to do, write down a goal. So you could write down, I want to have my own podcast. I want to join a mastermind. I want to have a kid. I want to move to LA. I want to move from LA, write down a desire you have, and then listen to your first thoughts, listen to your reaction, because every reaction is an education. And so if your first reaction is, you're too old. Who are you to do that? Nobody would listen to that. Somebody's already done that. You don't have the skills. You don't have the money, whatever. If those thoughts aren't pushing you forward, there's probably a broken soundtrack that you need to go in and say, okay, I'm not, I didn't even know I was listening to that. I don't want to listen to that. What am I going to do with that? But that, you know, that exercise, again, it can be any size goal it takes 30 seconds, 60 seconds, and you'll pretty quickly identify if you have some broken soundtracks. Wow. Well, you know, sometimes we don't even realize we have these broken sound tracks and something that will happen that will trigger one of those soundtracks. And it's sneaky how it comes in. And all of a sudden it starts growing and growing and, and growing. Well, every and time you listen to it, it gets easier to listen to it the next time. So the reason I'm a stay at home mom can, you know, or a working mom can drop their kid off and be five minutes late at, to pick them up later that afternoon 
and feel like I'm the worst mom in the world. She's five minutes late and goes, I'm the worst mom. The reason she can feel that and the reason she can ignore that she got them ready for school, she worked a full day, she's running a business, all these things. She can ignore all this evidence if she's listened to I'm the worst mom a thousand times. And so it's really easy for that one to start again almost automatically in a second of being late. And so, yeah, the longer, the more often you listen to it, the easier it is to listen to it again, which is why it takes some work sometimes to retire some of the broken ones. Yeah. Um, it's interesting after I had to kind of analyze my own soundtracks and then how I was reacting to my husband. So <laughs> yesterday I bought some supplements and they were kind of expensive. I mean, they're like 75 bucks and, um, I've been homesick with the, the vid, um, getting over it. And so my husband, I said, can you go pick these up? I've already paid for them. And he goes to pick them up and he goes, oh my gosh, you paid 70 or 75 bucks for these supplements. And my soundtrack was, I'm not worth it. I don't, I don't deserve such expensive supplements. Like that started playing. Sure. And so then I started telling him, so you don't think I'm worth it. You don't think I'm worth it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then you go way into a bigger conversation over a it supplement. Yeah. And he yeah. was like, where is this coming yeah. from? <laughs> and I was yeah, just totally. like, oh, oh gosh. And then I started and I'm like, oh my gosh. Okay. John's book. I need to fix that soundtrack. I want to fix that. And so I think too, when I'm, you know, uh, I don't know about anybody listening, but I know that when I'm a little more run down or a little more tired, or maybe I haven't eaten properly or slept enough that those sneaky soundtracks can come in that are, that are not positive ones that I want to hear. And before I know they're just starting this whole soundtrack, you talk about in your book, how to turn the dial down mm -hmm. when you start to get those soundtracks that are really loud. How do you do that? Well, so that was an idea. I was, I was talking to a friend of mine named David Thomas and David Thomas is um, a counselor here in Nashville. He runs, he's part of um, a, a counseling center for uh, teens and children called Daystar and he's brilliant. And I was telling him about these ideas and negative soundtracks and broken soundtracks. And he said, John, the problem is people want there to be a switch. They think, okay, I've got to find the switch that'll make me never experience stress again, or I'll never be fearful again. I have people all the time say to me, John, when did you stop being afraid? And I think, and I tell them, well, I'll let you know when it happens, but it hasn't happened so far. I don't like when people say you can be fearless. I don't think that's true because at every new level, you do something new. There's new fear. The first mm -hmm. time I spoke to 10 people, I had 10 person fear. I've never done that. What if I said the wrong thing? But then I worked on it, got over it. And then I spoke to hundred people, hundred person fear. And I had to work on that thousand people, thousand person fear, 10,000 people, 10,000 person fear. And so he said, John, people want to find a switch to turn off the fear, turn off the stress, turn off the negativity. So we run around and we run around and go, okay, <gasps> yoga, that'll do it. And we try yoga really hard and intensely. We go, it's great. And then a month later, the stress comes back. We go, oh, it wasn't the switch. And we go look for something else. It'll be a diet. It'll be a book. It'll be a guru. It'll be a whatever. And you keep running around with this switch mentality. And he said, the truth is, it's not a switch, it's a dial. When your dial gets to 11, and it's going to, because life is challenging, you didn't plan to get COVID. Like three months ago, you weren't like, I bet like, it'd be great if when I talk to John, I could also be coming off of COVID, I'll schedule that. There's so many things <laughs> in life that are going to knock you over because that's what life does. Life is bigger and messier and more beautiful than we can even imagine, but we don't control it. And so he said, when things get to an 11, you have to turn down the dial and you have that ability. And so what that means is you go, I like to proactively say, and I teach this in the book, what are some turn down techniques? If I had five things, three things, 10 things, 20 things that I know, oh, wow, my dial's at 11. Um, and, and I want you to have a list. A physical list matters because the worst time to come up with something that reduces your stress is when you're in the middle of your stress. You're not going to be creative in that moment. Mm -hmm. So I'd much rather you pull out a piece of paper. It's almost like break glass in case of emergency. And you go, oh, that's right. I feel better when I'm outside and I haven't been outside in a long time. Or I feel better when I go to the beach or when I talk with my spouse or, you know, when I listen to an audio book or what, you know, whatever's on your list and it's your list, not like your things would be unique to you. Mine would be unique to me. So that's what a turn down technique is. Well, I, I love that. And I think that everybody does 
have a list. They just really need to go back to that list. Sometimes we forget. We forget. We a hundred percent forget. And like, here's the thing I tell people all the time. Fear comes free. Hope takes work. Fear comes free. Hope takes work. You Mm -hmm. don't have to look for negativity. It'll find you. We've all been in the grocery store in the middle of the day. And all of a sudden your brain goes, Hey, remember that time you messed up three years ago? Like Mm -hmm. recently my brain brought up that I had ruined somebody's surprise birthday party. Um, There was a woman I worked with. She sent out an email. I skimmed the email. She buried the lead in my defense. She should have said surprise party up top, but I ended up telling her husband, I went to the surprise party with my wife. We walked in, she stopped the music and said, this is John Acuff, the guy that ruined the surprise party. And I was like, Hey everybody, that was 20 years ago. And my brain the other day, I was like, Hey, Remember that time you blew that surprise oh party? God. Thought you wanted to think about that. You don't have to look for negativity, but hope takes work. Positivity takes work. And so that's what it means is to go, okay, how do I put in that work? How do I find, because you will forget good stuff. Everyone listening to this right now has had a season in their life where things were a little healthier. Like maybe they're eating a little better they are walking a little more, running, whatever. They were journaling, whatever. And then for whatever reason, they stopped doing that. And then when they start doing it again, it's like finding an old friend. And you go, wait a second, why did I, why did Mm -hmm. I stop doing this? This is one of my turn down techniques. So you will a hundred percent forget them unless you're deliberate. I think it's so important to be deliberate and, and unless you are, things will like your health might start whispering to you. Oh, you better start getting back to that list. Then it'll scream at you. And so now I'm like, okay, I hear you. I need to like get to my list of, because so much of our thoughts do, I think it all starts with mindset. And I think a lot of people are looking for a quick fix for so many things, for their pain, for their struggles, for, for their fear, for all of that. And it's so much about what you do every single day. And I know you had a practice. You started like looking in the mirror and yeah. Maybe driving your wife crazy a little bit. I don't know, but I think I would drive my husband crazy. But do you still look in the mirror with this practice? Tell us about the practice first. Well, and I didn't want to. Um, (laughs) Thanks for saying that because I don't really want to. But if it works, I'll do it. (laughs) Yeah, well, that was my attitude. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm pretty sarcastic. I grew up uh, when it comes to like positive thinking around stuff like Center It Live, like I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, doggone it, people like me or like, you know, serenity now on Seinfeld. So I had this attitude kind of of like positive thinking, positivity is dumb, it's cheesy. And there are some terribly cheesy motivational people on Instagram that I'm just like, ugh, I don't like, it's the dumbest. But then I kept talking <laughs> to all these really successful people that I looked up to. And if I would get them off camera, off mic, and I'd go, hey, what do you think about affirmations? They'd be like, oh, okay, is anybody looking? Or like, I got a little pep talk I give myself every afternoon. Or like, I got a couple words that are my mantra. Or I got a couple. And I was like, oh, no, I'm going to have to explore this. So I did. And so I went to what I think is one of the like, you know, godfathers of modern motivational thought, Zig Ziglar. And I had the chance to have lunch with he and his wife and his son before he passed away a few years ago. But he has a set of affirmations. So I said, I'm going to do these. He, it's a simple set. It's in the morning and at night. It's the first thing when you get it for bed, the last before you go to bed. And I said, I'm going to read them in the mirror and it's going to feel dumb and it's going to feel cheesy. And then the more I did it, the more I started to go, wait a second, this starts to make sense to me. And, and here's my personal experience. It was like when I went to have a reaction or a thought, my brain just grabbed the first song that was on the top. And the more I did this, the first song that was on the top was I'm confident, I'm humble, I'm generous, I'm kind. I'm, you know, all these things that I was practicing saying with Zig's affirmations. So then we studied it. Um, Mike Peasley, the PhD who helps me uh, research books, we studied what I called a new anthem, these 10 statements that we came up with. And so, yeah, it was really fun to see that have a positive impact. And so and yeah, you mentioned my wife, it drove her crazy. The, yeah, I put that in the book that she was like, you can't do that in the bathroom we share because like, it's ridiculous. And I don't know if I can make out with you later when you're like, I'm strong, I'm confident. <laughs> and like, so if anybody right now is listening to this and being like, that sounds so cheesy. Yes, I agree. I 100% agree. But I'm like you, like, I don't care if it works. Like, who am I trying to impress? Like, I remember I learned that lesson. I read 100 books one year as a, as a personal goal. And I would post about the books and people would go, oh, 
like an audio book doesn't count or, oh, uh, that children's book doesn't count or, oh, um, a gra- you know, a comic book or a graphic novel doesn't count. And I would kept, I kept saying, well, this is the John Acuff personal reading challenge. And so who gets to decide what counts? Is it, is it John Acuff? Because I feel like I should be the only judge and jury on the John Acuff personal reading challenge. So like who gets to say what counts? I get to see what counts. So I don't care if, if other people understand it or if they think it's cheesy or whatever. If I see benefit in my life, then I'm going to explore it. I'm going to experiment. I'm going to tinker and see, okay, wow, how high performance can this trick, this tip, this tool make me? And how can I teach other people? Like, and if, and that's where it gets fun is where you go. I tried it in my own life and it worked. Like right now I'm in the middle of trying a time management system. That's been phenomenal for me, Uh, but I've only done it six weeks. So I'm not going to write about it yet. But once I have more evidence, then I'm going to go, Ooh, okay. I think this would help other people. And so that's kind of my process. Um, and that's what happened with the affirmations, even though, again, I went in with an attitude like this is the dumbest thing ever. It's so cheesy, um, but I don't know what to tell you. It works. Well, for you guys who get the book, it's on page 153. Um, and I think even in your audible book, you have a down. And yep. one thing that I love is in your audible book, um, you again, you're talking to me in that book, but you're, when you're, it's a conversation, you're talking and you're like, by the way, if you're listening to this, you can download all of this right now. And you give us that. So people can, even if they're listening, they can get those downloads. Well, I'm but, sure it's, I'm sure you've seen the same thing as an author. More and more people are listening to audio because a book is the last single function form of content. When I listen to a book, I can do the laundry. When I listen to a book, I can make dinner. I can go to the gym. I can commute to work. You can't do that holding a physical book. So I really appreciate that for a large growing number of people walking around the neighborhood while listening to an audio book is how they want to, you know, enjoy content. So I, as a author, want to make sure that I do everything I can to make that a really fun process for people. So if I have a PDF Because I, you know, like if there's an illustration from a book, I want you to be able to go download the PDF for free because the audiobook people shouldn't miss that. Well, that everything that you have thought through for the whole process was was amazing. I was like, oh my gosh, this is like a blueprint for me for my next book. Seriously, I'm gonna just do exactly what you did. I'll give you credit. I'll be like, and thanks to John. Um, but I'm like you when something works. I don't care how silly or how crazy it might seem. If it works, I'm going to do it. I mean, I've been sober now for years. And when I first went to my sponsor, I didn't care what she told me to do. I was like, okay, if that's what I have to do to Mm -hmm. stay sober and you're telling me I'm going to do it. Some things I didn't really like, or I didn't really go, Oh, I really am excited about this, or I really hate doing this. I mean, I I was like, if it works, obviously I, it works for you. You've, you know, she'd been sober. She's been sober for over 20 years. I'm going to do it. Um, and so, yeah, I'm like you. So I love the affirmations. Actually, I have my favorite affirmation and it is on a post-it note on my computer because I believe that they're, they're powerful when you get to, to say those things. Cause yeah, those negative thoughts, the, and negative comments that people might say, man, they stick like Velcro. Oh, yeah, yeah, totally. And there's plenty of those around. And so, yeah, I think you have to actively work against them and not just hope that you remember something positive, but that you actually work on remembering something positive. Yeah. So make a list, also make a list of things that, that really bring you joy, like, and and fill you up for me, that's going outside that's spending time with, you know, my kids with my husband, but make a list working out. And it's sometimes when you're in a tough situation and you can't do those things that it makes you appreciate those things even more. Yeah, totally. For, For sure. Um, you have five borrowed soundtracks, and this is one of my favorite things in the book when you tell the story about borrowed. But so can you explain a little bit about borrowed soundtracks? Yeah, so it can be intimidating for somebody if you go, hey, just write down new soundtracks for your life. Like it's intimidating to go to a blank piece of paper. I always tell people, 
I don't believe in writer's block. I believe in idea bankruptcy. I never go to a blank piece of paper alone. I always bring ideas with me. I'm collecting ideas. I'm collecting ideas. So I would never tell a reader or a listener, hey, just go to a blank piece of paper and good luck figuring out some new soundtracks. That's overwhelming to me. I, it would be overwhelming to other people. So I say, you know, start to pay attention to stuff that moves you. Start to, you know, start to, and it, like from anywhere. And, and the model I use, um, Dorothy Parker, who is a writer from like the 60s, her definition of creativity is creativity is a wild mind and a disciplined eye. And what she means by that is you have this wild mind where you fill it up with lots of different topics. You fill it up with a song lyric or something your kid said or a billboard you said you saw in like, you know, in Beverly Hills or whatever. You fill it up and then you have the discipline to see the connection between them. So that's what I try to do. So just for instance, yesterday um, I interviewed Kathy Heller, um, on my podcast. Oh, I podcast. just had her on my podcast last week. Yeah, yeah she's fantastic. Um, yeah, she is. And she, uh, my podcast is called All It Takes Is a Goal. So we were talking about goal setting. And one of the things she said was, I do two things, free and expensive. Free and expensive. She said, like, I do a ton of free content, but if you then are going to get access to me and my, like, it's going to be expensive. And I love the idea of free and expensive, free and expensive. Like, so I wrote that down in my journal. So that's what I mean by borrowing. I try to go, okay, Am I paying attention to the world, to what people are trying to teach me from people I respect, from songs I hear? Um, and then I actively collect it um, and I go, OK, I don't know where I'll use this, but I but I might someday. I'm a big believer in um, we're going for quantity initially, not quality. I think we we miss a lot of great ideas when we self edit before we even write them down, where we don't even give the idea the chance to go from our head to a piece of paper. I think every idea deserves at least 10 seconds of paper. And so that's what I do. I collect a bunch and then I've got, you know, I'm able to borrow from other people and go, oh, this Kanye thing was interesting to me, or this other line was fascinating to me. That's kind of how I live my life. And then once you do that, you'll start to see them everywhere. And you'll realize, wow, the world has so many smart, creative, talented, generous people that I can learn from. Yeah. Uh, wasn't Kanye's, my life is dope. Yeah. He, uh, so the <laughs> Kanye story, I saw that on um, the Jimmy Fallon show on the tonight show. Dave Chappelle was telling Jimmy Fallon about a time, the first time he knew Kanye was going to be a star. And Kanye was kind of unknown at the time, but he was um, with uh, Dave Chappelle watching some skits that nobody had seen before, like Rick James, all these skits that would become famous. And he got a phone call and he's like, hold on a second. And somebody clearly wanted Kanye to go do something. He said, no, I can't do that. I'm at, you know, the Dave Chappelle show watching skits no one's ever seen and he paused and he said because my life is dope and i do dope and then he hung up and i love that idea of like because my life is dope like that's what i so i use that one to push against must be nice there's this internal broken soundtrack that i have to push back against which is you know like i don't know like imagine like an old woman then you go oh this thing happened i, I live in la or oh this thing i bought 75 dollars supplements whatever and someone goes oh, it must must be nice to have 75 dollars for supplements like this shameful guilty you know success room yes. joy ceiling and so i would rather go yeah my life is dope it is like i can't believe like i you know i get to do this thing and and that's one that i i constantly remind myself of because it's so easy to and part of it is the internet's fault like humble brag is a phrase people use to tear you down so if you go oh my gosh i'm so excited about this thing that just happened people will go oh humble brag and you go no 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 i was celebrating that like wow the podcast is doing well or wow this thing like and they go must be nice and it's all this we'll share in each other's misery but people have a really hard time when you start doing well um, online. And I just, I don't want to accept that. I want to be excited. Like, I don't want to be braggadocious, but there's a big difference between being excited and being arrogant. And my life is dope. Helps me remember that. I love that. Yeah. You know, I remember I had, I drove the same old truck. I love trucks and I had the same F-250 for years and I finally got a new car. And my husband was like, oh, well, don't post about that. You don't was want it to post a, like, is it a dope? Like, what are you, do you share about it? Is it a it, secret? Uh, well, I don't think it's a secret, okay. but my, I'm going to start saying my life is dope. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a Tesla. I've never been a car girl mm -hmm. and I've always had a truck. I mean, we go to the barn every day with my daughter's an equestrian. And so, um, I finally get this dope 
car, thanks to my teenager who researched and researched and researched it. And she finally convinced me to go test drive it. And I cried during the test drive, really? by the way, you loved it that much. I loved it that much because it is got auto, it has autopilot and my right leg, I have, you know, 34 surgeries on my right leg and it, it's really hard to push. I can drive with my left leg, mm -hmm. but it's kind of a pain in the ass. And so yeah. the guy, it goes, okay, go ahead and put it on autopilot. And I'm like, I didn't have to touch the steering wheel or anything. He's, I said, are you sure it's going to stop? We're in stop and go traffic here in yeah. LA. He goes, yeah, it's going to stop. And it stopped. And my leg was really hurting that day. And I remember just feeling this sense of relief and freedom. Oh, that's awesome. Freedom. Like I can drive anywhere. Cause I don't have to drive. It'll drive yeah, for good me. Good leg day, bad leg day. You have a lot of freedom. I've got the freedom. And so I started crying and the guy looked at me like, Oh my gosh. And he goes, I've never had anybody cry during a test drive before. <laughs> and great. so I bought the car and I was, I was really excited about it mm -hmm. for more reasons than just like, look at me. Oh, I'm sure. Cool. Yeah. It yeah. was like, no, this is freedom to me, mm -hmm. but my husband being, and you know, he's, he didn't, he, I don't know what he meant, but he's like, well, don't post about Well, he like, didn't want you to get, you know, like internet people to slam you over whatever. Like he, that was a protective statement. I mean that I, yeah. I he's very that. protective. Yeah. He's a, he's a cop. He's yeah. very, that he's a very protective and he, it's really hard for me when I share anything and I'm, I'm an open book. So I share a lot through my sure. podcast and through post. And he's always just like, please don't get me on camera. Please don't share. Yeah. Please don't tell yeah. anything. My please wife's don't. greatest nightmare is being on camera. So whenever I get her on, everybody is like, that was a big deal. Jenny, Jenny made an appearance. So she's like, you can do all the stage time you want. I'll be backstage. Like, so it's, it's funny how I think a lot of couples are like that. Well, that's nice to hear. Thank you for sharing that with me mm -hmm. because yeah, my husband does not like it at all. And I have a red carpet event coming up and I'm like, I've, I get to interview people on the red carpet. I was like, oh my gosh, isn't this exciting? And he goes, no, I, I don't want to go to that. Why would I yeah. want to go to that? And I'm just like, okay, stop the soundtracks in my yep. head. Cause it can turn into something not so nice. Oh so, yeah. Well, I mean, I like, we had that conversation just the other day where somebody was, we have another couple friends and the husband was trying to get the wife to do one of his favorite activities. And Jenny said, that would be like, John, if you asked me to go running, she hates running. She goes power walking with friends all the time. She's in great shape, but she can't stand running. And it would be wrong for me to go. She's not right. Cause she doesn't like the same thing. I like, like what, you know, like who wants a marriage like that? I wanted to have passions that I don't share and vice versa. And so I think sometimes when we give our spouses the freedom to do that, we go, Oh, that's right. Like, or even sharing an idea. I always tell married couples, like, don't expect them to mirror your excitement because number one, it's your idea. Number two, you've probably thought about it for six months. You gave them six minutes to react. Um, you know, number three, they might be processors that are different. So like, there's a lot of times where a spouse would go, look at this thing I want. And they, and because the other spouse doesn't mirror their excitement, it becomes this big fight or why don't you support me? Or I thought you'd be into this. And so there's so many ways sharing an idea with a spouse can go kind of sideways. Thank you for saying that. Yeah. I remember when I first, they called me to be on today's show there and they called and said, Megan Kelly wants to interview you. And I was like, Megan Kelly. And I got, my husband was the first person I called and I'm like, honey, oh my God they want to have me on the today show. Mm -hmm. And he goes, oh, you're on your own. I'm not going to New York. That's I'm like, I'm not doing that. Yeah. And, and so I was like, okay, well, I'm going That's click. Funny. What a and fun adventure though. Yeah. Well, he called me right after and he's like, you know what? That, that is actually cool. And I said, you know what? They want to fly you out too. And he goes, Oh, well, okay. Yeah. That is that's, pretty cool. Okay. So yeah. I can do that. But it it's so good for me to hear you say that we get excited about something like I wrote my book for months mm -hmm. and months before it was the buildup to that point where they wanted to interview me for yeah. that. And, and it's so good to hear you say, well, we've had months to prepare for something. They've got a few minutes and we can't expect their reaction to be the same. And I also have to pause and kind of put myself in their position and, and where their thoughts may 
be coming from and what, what they must be thinking, sure. you know? Um, and also about Kanye. Yeah. I, he built, um, a place right down the street from us, from our barn. And we got invited to go to one of his gospel. Oh, fun. Fun. It was so much fun. And so they were like, okay, yeah. I mean, it was really a beautiful ceremony. It's in the middle of, you know, outside and this amazing music. And, and they're like, okay, don't video though. You cannot video yeah. this. And I was like, okay. And then I look around, I'm like, well, I see other people kind of video in here. So I think I'll video a little bit. <laughs> and I was That's like, funny. they came by really quick. Stop videoing. I'm like, okay, <laughs> sorry. Sorry about That's that. So funny. But he was really really nice. I mean, oh, he got down hear. on his knee to meet my daughter. She was like in heaven and oh, yeah. So, yeah. So I'm sure you've got to meet some really interesting people. I over haven't years. met Kanye, but that's uh, that feel I met, I met Michael Jordan as a child when I was a child, not him as a child, but I've never met Kanye. That's he's, although in Nashville, you see country music stars all the time. You're just not supposed to talk to them. Like you're supposed to pretend like they're just normal people. Nashville is one of those. I don't know how LA is, but at least in Nashville, it's kind of an unwritten rule that like you don't bother. Like if Cher if you see Cheryl Crow at the grocery store, like she's a lady at the grocery store. It seems like that's kind of the Nashville way. Oh, really? Good mm -hmm. to know. Yep. Well, I feel like it's kind of like that in LA, or maybe I just I see so many celebrities here that all you're the time. Used to it that I'm used yeah. to it. You know, you see them at the, at the market and stuff. And yeah. so I don't think about it, but I remember my mom coming out here to visit one time and she was like, Oh my gosh. And freaking out over seeing somebody at a coffee shop. I'm like, yeah, mom, they come here all the time, but like, yeah, you know, but coffee. it's different. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> to drink coffee. Yeah. Exactly. But, um, who are some of the people that inspire you um, some of your favorite books. Mm -hmm. Cause I know in your newsletter, sometimes you, you send out some oh, of yeah. your favorite books well, and stuff like that. I just read the inner game of tennis and I, I absolutely love that. It's a book about mindset and it was super challenging and like just genius. And that's, he's a West coast guy. I forget the name of the author, but inner game of tennis I'm reading. I hate running and you can too. And I love this book. It's so really good. It's so good. And I'm, I'm a runner, um, but it's illustrated and it's funny and it's interesting. And so, and the title, I hate running and you can too, is so fantastic. Um, Such I a great title. The Slight Edge. Um, I just read that the other day. I'm in the middle of clockwork. And so, yeah, I, I usually have a couple books going at a time, but the question I always ask people is like, what's the book you've given away more than any other book? And the one for me, the answer to that one for me is um, The War of Art. I've given more friends Stephen Pressfield's The War of Art than any, I mean, other than my books, because I have books in the trunk like MC Hammer. So if you see me around town and go, hey, it's John Ingham, I'll give you a book. Um, but The War <laughs> of Art is up there for me on most given away. I'm just laughing because you said MC Hammer. That was the very first music video I danced in when I moved to LA. Which was, song? Can't touch this. What? You should yeah. have led with that. You buried the lead. You should have been like, I'm so glad you're on my podcast. Also, I was in You Can't Touch This. That's hilarious. <laughs> what <laughs> other videos were you in that you danced in? Oh was my like gosh. I, I was like the token white girl in that video. I know right. I, I can, I can move. I can shake a tail feather. I can so do some great. hip hop tap dancing. Um, I was on Townsend television when that was out for a while as one of their dancers, um, Melissa Etheridge, John okay. Brannon. Um, I did a ton of industrials and, and gotcha. music videos, but, um, MC Hammer was probably my favorite. I think part of it was I had so many people that were like, oh, you will never make it as a dancer in LA. You know, I'm from a small town. They're like, you will, you'll be back. You're going to run out of McDonald's coupons and you'll be right <laughs> back. And I, a month later, you know, I'd saved up $1,200 packed my little Suzuki Samurai. And a month later I auditioned for that and got it. That's and let crazy. me tell you, everything changed. You know, I was, I did that video and I came home and there was a line of cars around my mom's house to That's be like, so funny. yeah, 
We know her. Yeah. <laughs> and we I mean, knew I just, she'd make it. We knew she'd make it. Yeah, we knew exactly. she'd make yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah, it was it was so much fun. But yeah, so I want people to also be able to sign up for your newsletter because I yeah. want them to get, you know, have the ideas that you have. Sure. Um, so where's the best place? And I'll have a link. So if you're running right now on the treadmill or you're mm -hmm. driving, you can find in the show notes, the link for the book, his, all of his books. Um, but also will you tell them the best place to sure. find you and sure. to get your books and maybe sign up for your newsletter as well? Yeah. So the newsletter is acuff.me slash newsletter. So A-C-U-F-F dot M-E slash newsletter. Um, I have a podcast called All It Takes Is a Goal. If you want to start and maybe just listen to one episode, Colleen Berry is somebody I interviewed. You've probably ne never heard of her, but she lost her job um, in the middle of the dot-com bust. She was a documentary filmmaker. She had to take a bunch of jobs to survive. And one of them was as a receptionist. And she decided, I'm going to change my mindset. I'm going to change my soundtracks. And she did. And she's now the CEO of the company. So she went from receptionist to CEO. And so if you want an example of somebody who did it, somebody that will encourage you, um, that's a great podcast episode. My books are sold everywhere. And then um, I'm John Acuff on Instagram, J-O-N, and Twitter, and, and all the social media channels. Yeah, John, your podcast is amazing. I, that oh, that was the episode that I actually listened to. Yeah, she's amazing. Like I was taking notes about my own life with some of the stuff. Just, I mean, she, you know, just to see, and it took a while. Like I don't think there's anything that's amazing that happens overnight. It takes time. And her story was so encouraging to me that you know. So that would be the one I'd say, like, start there and then and then go from there. Yeah, it's so good and. I love in your book, you talk about resilience. You say, we think of resilience as having the toughness of a Navy SEAL, but really it's the opportunity to begin again when things don't go as planned the first time. I love yeah, that. And, and that's happened to everyone. Everyone listening to this podcast has had something this year not go as they planned it. I keep telling people, like when it comes to making plans, three days is firm, three weeks is fuzzy, three months is fictional. And that's hard. Like I can tell you three days from now, this thing is going to happen. Three weeks, a little fuzzier, three months, it's fiction. And that's hard for people. And so everybody, everybody has needed some resilience this year. Oh, that is such a great way of looking at it. I mean, I had a friend last night that I was on the phone with and she was saying, well, I, when, when are you going to the hotel? The event starts on the 21st. Like she was going over mm -hmm. details of this event. And I was like, the whole idea of this event is just be cool. Like, we don't know. They're just <laughs> yeah. be cool. Like, yeah, you know, funny. just yeah. like, you give us a little, you gotta yeah, roll with just, it. Yeah. just roll with it. We don't yeah. know what's going to happen. It's not easy. It's not easy, but it's, it's where a lot of us are right now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I am so glad that I got to talk with you. I have just enjoyed your book so oh, much. Thank you. And the book cover, it matches all of my branding too. So yeah, uh, I, I love bright colors. I bright colors make me happy. So I think that's something we share um, is that bright, bright colors are fantastic. Yeah, I love it. And one more thing before I forget, I loved your acknowledgments in the back of the book too. Oh, I got thanks. like a little teary eyed when I read that the best part of you opening for Dolly Parton was getting to go <laughs> yeah. in the audience. Yeah, it's true. It was amazing to come down from the crowd and see my kids and have, you know, my two. I've got a, ri a she's not rising. She's a senior and a sophomore in high school. Um, and so, yeah, I, I don't take either of those um, people that I get to spend a lot of time with, whether it's my wife or my daughters for granted. It's, it's super fun. Oh, that's so special. And Dolly Parton. I have a t-shirt with her face on it. I she's love the her. queen. She's there. She she's is. amazing and was the sweetest person. And yeah, that was, that was super fun. And she's a Nashville icon. And so that was, yeah, I, I have nothing but good things to say about, I don't know anybody who says bad things about Dolly Parton. She's like one of the few people on the planet that I think universally people are like, yeah, she's, she's awesome. Like she's, She's found a way to build this amazing empire that helps. I mean, she's given away like a hundred million books. I could talk about Dolly all day. This is a Dolly well, podcast though. I love her. We'll do a yeah. whole nother podcast. We share on that. Her. That's one more thing we share. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you y'all. Make sure you check out the show notes. And if there was one part that was your favorite part in the show, screenshot it and tag us on Instagram. 
at Amberly Lago Motivation and John, it's spelled J O N, just so you know, on, yeah, on um, Instagram. And um, thank you for listening in. And John, thank you so much for being here and sharing your wisdom. Thanks for having me.